Hi, my name is Graham Sibley, and I want to thank you for joining our conversation with my friend and filmmaker, Deborah Eisenstein. Over the past two decades, Deborah's work as an actress, a writer, a director, and producer has proven to deliver not only awards, accolades, and critical acclaim, but one of the most authentic indie voices working today. Her sensibility is tragically funny, while she effortlessly teeters between naturalism and caricature. Her films have screened at every major film festival uh, in the United States, including Sundance, South by Southwest, and Slam Dance, where her first feature film, Daydream Believer, won the Grand Jury Prize. In 2002, she earned an Independent Spirit Award for Someone to Watch, and has picked up uh, countless other awards from festivals all around the world. Deborah is truly an actor's director, and I've been lucky enough to work with her on two of her films, Before the Sun Explodes, and her most recent film, Blush, which was in U.S. Dramatic Company at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival, and it will be released on April 10th. Um, Blush stars Wendy McClendon-Covey, Christine Woods, Max Burkholder, and Steve Little. So without further ado, my friend Deborah Eisenstadt. Hi, Deborah. Hi. That was a Thank very you. nice introduction. Thank you. Well, it's all very, very true. Um, how are you doing with all of this crazy quarantine stuff? Um, this cautionary tale we're living in where nature attacks um oh, that's, it's crazy it's crazy yeah I yeah know. revenge for climate change so i just want i wanted to start uh, thank you for doing this and I, I just wanted to start kind of from the beginning of your of your career um so or your life um where were you born and raised and what did your parents do for a living okay i was born in in brooklyn downstate i was actually just watching a horrifying uh, thing on CNN. They were at Downstate where I was born, where all the, um, they're, they're just turning it into a COVID-19 oh. ER, and it's horrifying. Anyway, oh. I was born in that hospital, and um, I grew up in Rockaway in Queens, New York. And um, my, pa my mom was an artist, and my dad a businessman. Okay, cool. Public and school in Queens, yeah. Public school. And did you have siblings? I have a sister and two brothers. I'm the third of four. You're the, you're the third of four. Okay, cool. Um, and you are your siblings in the arts? My sister. My sister's a novelist, and we've collaborated at times. And um, my brothers are a business too. So, like the girls went to the arts, and the guys. It was Just very like, much like there is some, you know gender stuff going on in my family. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Do you, think, do you think that part of that was generational or do you think it was yeah. just... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also sure. just like Jewish Brooklyn um, background, you know, where there's... It's very kind of dated now, you know. Right, right. How much of a part... How, how much of a part was going to the movies in your, in your childhood? Going to the movies or theater? Not so much. Well, the theater... My, we think my parents took us to Broadway shows. I was lucky enough to go to Broadway shows when I was a kid. Wow. And I, I have vivid memories of, of that. My, my background, my, the start, my start was really in theater. And then I um, was very interested in acting from a really early age. And, um, you know. How did you get involved? How did you, was it by going to the shows? Well, it started with that, but it was really my sister who's six years older than me, who was always a writer. And I remember she had lots of plays on her shelves. Mm -hmm. And I was always interested in everything she was interested in. And I started reading, when I was really young, plays. Uh, in my memory, mostly Tennessee Williams. Huh. And I feel like he was really the first um, thing that got me really interested. And it was reading plays. And then I remember doing making up plays on my block with kids on my block from the time I was like five. Hmm. And I, I always took it really seriously. And then finally, um, my mom recommended this camp because I was going to public schools in Queens and there wasn't really, there was no like real arts program, but it was like an arts camp. And it was there that I met an acting teacher named Kate Harper. Um, and I started at 13, like taking the subway, the bus to the subway into the city to take acting classes with her. Wow. And um, I was kind of hooked. And I just have done, I did a lot of acting classes 
from the time I was young. Instead did, you, of different did you jump into like the audition stuff when you were that young? No, just did school stuff. And I was really more interested in, in classes. I remember I wrote a play in sixth grade. Oh, wow. <laughs> cast people in my class. And um, no, it wasn't ever actually done, but you know, I wrote the play. What I was it about? I wrote the play. Was it, it, was called, it was called, I think, A Typical American Family. I have the play somewhere, I think. And um, I tried to enlist people back then. Um, I, I don't know what, you know, I had got one taker, like one friend that was really into it, who actually remembers it. Um, funny. And I would cast people in my class. And it was like a fantasy kind of thing, you know. Well, not much has changed. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing, nothing's changed, really. It's kind of true. You don't change. You are who you are. And I, and I believe that now that I have kids too, because I have three very different kids. Interesting. Yeah. I, I have two children as well. And it's interesting to see they're just starting to show signs of uh, personality. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how they come out of the womb and now nine months later where, where they are. Um, so you mentioned that you did a lot of uh, theater. Um, and you've worked with some pretty incredible uh, American playwrights, uh, some of the best, um, David Mamet, Wendy Wasserstein. Um, what, was, uh, what was it like working with, with them um, at such a young age? Um, well, I was in my early 20s. Um, and, you know, when you meet people that are that kind of, I guess, special or talented or you know anyone who I've ever met who's sort of at the top of their game there's just this no bullshit no um there's something just so maybe generous is the word or there's something that is connected between all the amazing um people who are, are at the height of their power um and they got there not out of kind of I don't know, there's a lot of like people in the middle that will kind of try to tear you down is what I'm trying to say. And then when you meet somebody like a David Mamet or a Wendy Wasserstein, there is, I guess, a generosity and a kindness mm -hmm. and of spirit that I guess has to be there in order to be where they are. Right. You know right. what I mean? Like, and I think my, my struggle a lot as an actress was the in-between people that were kind of, because I had success at a young age and they were jealous or confused or baffled by that, whether it was casting directors or there's still all these subtle um, digs you get or passive aggressive shit that goes on between actors. And right. uh, you know, when you meet, then you meet like a David Mamet or a Wendy Wasserstein and there's just this, the, a purity, I guess, of, um, yeah. Well, Does that make sense? am I making any sense? You're making complete sense. And I think like I watched Oleana last night and your performance is so incredible. That text is so dense and technically you're just such a, a fine actress and, and your performance in it is amazing. And, and you and William H. Macy just, just are at, at odds. If anyone hasn't seen that movie, you, you really should, should check it out. Deborah's performance is incredible. Um, what was it? What was it like working with someone so uh, powerful, uh, l like uh, with like William H Macy? Uh, what, what was what was that uh, in such an intimate way? I mean, you guys were really every scene is just you guys. Yeah. Well, we did the play first, right? So by the time we did the movie, I had done the play for like a year, um, uh, on and off, you know. Um, but I got that role through an open call in the backstage. In backstage. Oh my gosh. Of the understudy. Wow. They were looking for the understudy. Wow. And because I think it was because I was so young, I was 22 when I went on that open call, which was how I was getting parts. And I was working like off off Broadway, getting parts through open calls. Um, and I went to that open call. I hadn't seen the play. Um, and I kept getting called back and called back. So by the time I got the role, um, I, 
I saw the, I, they sent me back, they had, had me see, finally see the play. I'd only read the play. And this is what's interesting, is when you read the play, I had a very strong perspective, a very strong, clear vision of what this play was, what this character was. Right. I was doing all my homework, I was doing everything. And then when I saw the play, it wasn't the play in my mind. How was it different? In so many ways. I'm not going to get into how it was different, right. but it was just so different. But I think this is the beginning of me wanting to be a director, is what I'm trying to say. Right. And, and, and so I was like, I also had this kind of ridiculous confidence at the time because I was so young and I had been studying for over a decade by then. And I, I was ready. Like I felt like I was ready and I could do this. And so I went in and I, I got the part as an understudy. And by the first understudy rehearsal, I knew the, all, the entire part. I knew all my lines. I was totally prepared. And I was sitting there in David Mamet at an understudy rehearsal, at a rehearsal for his wife was leaving the, the play and the understudy was taking over and I was taking over the understudy part. And so at one of those rehearsals to let the understudy in, I would sit there and just observe because I was coming in as the understudy. And he, he looked at me at one of the rehearsals and he said, you want to try? And I was like, sure. And I was ready. I was real. I mean, that, this is where preparation really is important because yeah. if I hadn't known all my lines by then, you know, I knew all my lines, I was ready to go. And I, I went up there and I was like, I can, you know, I had all that confidence and all that preparation right. and I ended up taking over the role. Wow. And he asked me to do the film, you know, m much later, but that was also because his wife was supposed to do the role in the film, but she got pregnant and had, um, she was sick. Mm -hmm. pregnancy and they needed someone to come in and so you know ever the understudy I was prepared I was ready to go how much time did you guys how, how long did it take you to shoot that I think it was like a month a month oh oh and so then this is what the, you this experience working on Oleana inspired you to go to film school well what was one of the things I mean I studied writing and painting and theater in college. So I had a, I've always had a lot of different interests. It was just that when I graduated uh, college, I started going to open calls and I started getting work as an actress. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't, you know, and because I was getting work, I just started working professionally as an actress. Sure. Um, when I saw the film of Oleana, again, I was like, not my choice. Like, these are not, these are not the choices I would make. And I, you know, I had very strong ideas about how things should be. And when they weren't the way they should be, I would get really frustrated. So there was a level of frustration. And then I was getting, back then, I moved to LA and I started doing television. And television was, then was not television now. Right. So there were a lot of roles I was getting that were, I don't know, the scripts were just, I, I couldn't get into them. And I couldn't, I would be on set, I got cast in some really bad television show that was only 13 episodes or something, but there were actors on set that were so grateful to be there, to have right. a job. Right. And I was just, I wasn't at that place. And I just said, this is, I shouldn't be doing this. This isn't fair. Somebody else should have this part if I'm going to have this attitude. You know, like I kind of put myself in check, like, you know, what's wrong with you? Um, well, you came out of the gate so hot. Yeah, but also, I had a level, like, I think I had, I was depressed. Like, I had a kind of a low-grade depression. Um, I hated auditioning. I didn't like the parts I was going up for. I had an agent and a manager, and they used to fight all the time. And they would, like, badmouth each other to me. Like, I was just in a really bad, like, I didn't know what I was doing. No one taught me the business of acting. Right. Uh, and the business of acting versus just being in a, acting class was just, the op it was like an upside down world. You know, I was like, this sure. is not what I, was signed, I thought I was signing up for. Sure. Then the cherry on the cake for me to stop acting was getting cast in a play. It was like an epic production of the Greeks that I did in a theater that was supposed to go to Lincoln Center. And the director was just an awful womanizer. And he locked me in between floors of an elevator. Like I felt completely, not only the sensation of being someone's puppet, but yeah. uh, just powerless. And I think, you know, a lot of the reason I was acting was because of 
trauma from my past. I was working stuff out through these roles and I was getting cast as the victim all the time. And um, it was very cathartic, but at the same time, it wasn't, I wasn't doing it necessarily for the healthiest reasons. Right. And I think uh, I was depressed and I found, I was living down the block from the new school and I wanted to do some writing and some, really wanted to direct theater, but um, there was a film class and I was like, I can do a short film or something. So I, I went down the block, I signed up for a, a short film class. I learned, started learning how to make films. I made a short and that short got into South by Southwest. And right out of the gate, wow. Right the, my first short. And then they, they offered me a scholarship to get my, my master's degree actually in media studies. And I was like, oh, this is my out. Yeah. And I started acting, and I went back to graduate school for three years. And um, I, what was so appealing about that program was, like, at NYU, you have to work on everyone else's movies, which is great experience. But I was already 28. I already had an acting career. And I already knew what I wanted to do. Like, I wanted to make films. I wanted to. So I had this thing in mind where I'm going to make a feature. And they said to me, no, you can't do that here. But there was all this equipment that nobody was using. All this, and I was like, gonna learn all the technical skills, I'm gonna do it myself. I had this idea in my head. And again, because I think I was young and I just was like, why not? Um, and I, I had all these friends that were actors that wanted to work. And I just started rounding them up and shooting them. And I made this feature, despite the fact that they told me I couldn't for my thesis. And that is what got me started because that feature, one, um, the Grand Jury Prize at Slam Dance and right. the Independent Independence Spirit Award. This is, this is Daydream Believer, which yeah. is um, an aspiring actress impulsively leaves her small Vermont town <laughs> in New York City to pursue her dream of being famous. Yeah, <laughs> and so I got to sort of, it was a bit much sublimate all that passive aggressive shit that I put up with with sure. acting teachers sure. and casting directors and all the garbage I came with being an actor a young actress at that time in New York City. It was very much particular to a time and a place, you know. It, it's such a fantastic movie, and it's, it has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know if you know that. Well, yeah, it was beloved. It's, I mean, I loved that film. But it was like, the reason I think, you know, what's so great about it is that I never, it was a the, it was my student film. And so I didn't think anyone was going to see it. I didn't think it was going to be for like public consumption at all. It's and such it a masterpiece. It's like, it's like, it, it's so technically like sound. I mean, you, 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 you shot it on a DV camera or something and. I shot it, it myself. I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a crew. It's unbelievable. It's I mean, it's, it, and it, and it, and the performances in the, it, it's so ambitious. I mean, it's got, how many scenes like 200 scenes or something? Probably. Well, I think all my films have 200 scenes. <laughs> Yeah. Your first film, and there's like all these locations and all these characters, and it and it is the beginning of what now, having studied your your films over the last um, couple of weeks, what, what you do, what you were doing in Daydream Believer is really being um, replicated so well, and it's being refined in such a in such a um, in such a way, and you start off so. Excellent. And it's, it's really amazing what you're doing. It's like these, these little tapestries that you're creating around these characters. And um, so, so, uh, so what, what did you think that you were working out when you were making Daydream Believer? Like, do you think you were looking at your past as an actress and wanting to sort of say goodbye to that or what what was the what was the sort of cathartic journey of that yeah I mean I think it was about my evolution really of like you know there were a lot of people disappointed when I stopped acting my boyfriend for one you know hmm. I was questioned he was like why are you you know because I was a working actress yeah my parents like loved saying oh you know people in my family loved that I I mean my they my father is 87 now, and he still asks about my acting. <laughs> you know, like, it, it brings joy to other people to have some, you know. And I understand that. And I, I felt like the filmmaking thing, they didn't really get that as much. I don't know. I don't know. I think it was nice to see them be perform for them. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but 
I mean, I guess it's not, you know, I think it was a thrill. You know, I think it was a thrill for them to see me in plays and stuff. Um, and it was a thrill for me to be in them, but I just, um, I think did Daydream they, did Believer. They same, did they have the same reaction to Daydream Believer and in terms of its sort of truth that they were learning about you, about your journey? Maybe. I don't know. I just think, you know, I think some people look at actors as the end all be all. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, don't I, look, know. I look at directors as the end all be all. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, yes, they're very, my, my, my mom, first of all, my mom was very, very proud, but she's not alive. So she's not alive to see, you know, any of my other, she was, she saw the limbo room. That was the last thing that she saw. But, um, I know she was very proud of me no matter what I did. You know, my parents were the type of parents that they were proud of me no matter what anyway, you know. Um, but I just think they were confused. I think it was confusing for them, for people that I went, that I stopped. Yeah. That I made it, it was like a conscious decision to, to stop and go back to school. Was it a hard decision for you? No. Uh, no. It was really kind of, felt like a natural evolution. Hmm. And it wasn't like people were asking me, I wasn't being called up to audition. You know, it wasn't like I was that wanted as an actress. So I didn't really even feel that desire. It wasn't like there was something missing in the world that I wasn't acting. Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, I think about that like sometimes. like plenty of people that could play the roles that, I mean, I'm not, right. like, you know. Right. Um, and I'm not like a singer or dancer. Like I don't have like all these other extra talents that a lot of performers have where, you know. Um, I was good at playing certain things, you know? Right. So I knew my limitations too. Like, I feel like I was very pragmatic. Like I knew I could probably have, a, a, I could probably work in regional theater probably for the rest of my life. And I did a national tour of Wendy Wasserstein's yeah. Sisters Rose Flag. And I, I remember seeing, you know, actresses on tour for a year and leaving their four year olds home with their dad, and I was like, I don't want, I, I didn't want that life. Like, I really didn't want yeah. that life. But I felt like there was a room for me. Like, I definitely felt like there was a there was a place for me, room for me. I didn't know where it would be, but, it, you know, I didn't feel like I was necessarily, you know. So your next, your next film that you make, four years later after Daydream Believer, is also about an actress. Um, um, in, sort of undercovers the, and uncovers the, the world of off-Broadway um, understudies. Mm -hmm. And you make this movie in nine days for $30,000. While I was pregnant. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, how do you do this? You're like, I, I just so am so blown like away. It's necessity. It's not, it's nothing that's like, I feel like I would go crazy if I did not. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and but the that that's also a very it's really you and your sister wrote such a wonderful script and and you executed it so well. It's 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 a it feels like a step up in terms of production value and stuff. From well, I had a DP for that. what what's that? I did have a DP for that. Yeah, it, it yeah. feels like it. it. It feels like it, and it and but it feels like it, it's still your your sort of. Like I th I've heard, I read in uh, one of the art articles that you, you're, you, you use the word sentence structure. Like my films are all basically the same. They have the same sentence structure and it's the same thing. It's the same you, handwriting. Yes, same handwriting, right, the same handwriting. Yeah, and, and you can see it again in, in, this, in this film. Um, what do you feel like you were working out with this film, this is another actress, a protagonist. Well, the Limbo Room was, well, I think that we talked about this, but originally my thesis for graduate school was going to be a documentary where yes. I followed one actress and one understudy to the run of a Broadway show because right. I had been an understudy and I thought it was a fascinating little microcosm. Yeah. And I found after seeking out, I was allowed backstage because I knew a lot of people back then in the theater and they allowed me backstage and I cast this incredible actress and this incredible understudy to be in this documentary. And I can't say what they are, who they are, what it is, but I, what ended up happening was I got access to backstage, the actress, there was a rape scene on stage and the actress started accusing the actor of really harassing her on stage. Mm. And 
the actress, she was new, this was her Broadway debut. And I didn't get the sense that like she had a lot of support from the other actors who wanted to get involved in this case and her accusations and no one would back her. And her understudy, I felt like kind of knew that this was going on. Mm. And um, she wouldn't back her either. And so I thought this was fascinating, you know, but then I got kicked out of the theater and I never got to finish the documentary. So then I made Daydream Believer. But I did have the story then for the limbo room, which was kind of also connected to Oleana because I felt like that playing that role for a year where I got beaten on stage, every, every night when the actress gets beaten on stage, whether it was me or Rebecca Pigeon or Mary McCann, the audience would cheer. And I really took a toll on the, everyone who played that role. I bet. Um, and it was really affected. I remember really when I came into Oleana, like I heard about Rebecca being really affected by the, uh, that happening. And um, also just, you know, after playing such a villain, villainous role, um, when I would go to uh, auditions and meetings, I was seen as that mm -hmm. kind of, you know, they, I remember someone asking me, why would you do that? Right. You know, and this is, I think, a casting director. You know, it was very weird. Um, so I just, um, I, I thought it was interesting how the the blur the lot blurred lines between reality and fiction can happen, especially when you're experiencing it when you're in the role. And so that film was informed by that 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 it that that what happened. Right. Right. And then and and. So then you, you go 10 years later, you make another film about uh, a performer, a stand-up comedian, a fledgling stand-up comedian, stay-at-home dad, called Before the Sun Explodes. Um, that's where we met. And um, so what takes, what were you doing in those 10 years? Um, and, and then why, why that film? Well, why did you just I had, like I said, I was pregnant with my second child when I had, did the limbo room. I had a two-year-old and I was pregnant when I, when I did the limbo room. <laughs> then my mom got very sick with cancer and I took care of her. I, I really became her advocate. Um, and then I got pregnant with my third. And I, we moved from Manhattan into my, you know, her house. She managed to stay alive for two years with stage four pancreatic cancer. And that was my life. Like I, I became, you know, very knowledgeable about cancer and I just, I just wanted to be with her and my kids. So I was just taking care. I was being, being a caretaker for that time. And then um, I was writing, I was writing the whole time. Um, and I actually started writing what is now blush at this time. Um, but when I came out to, and then I was also helping my husband's a filmmaker and I was working and supporting his career and helping him with his stuff. Um, and letting him be the, you know, he was in the spotlight a lot. Yeah. So you're um, married to, to Brett Morgan, who's, uh, an incredible filmmaker as well. Um, and right, so he's doing documentaries and he was doing commercials and he was working all the time and he wasn't home a lot. Like he was very much, you know, it was very traditional setup back then, but I was also really wanted to be with my mother at the end of her life and really just didn't care. I didn't care. I wanted to be with my kids. I wanted to be with my, you know, right, 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 right. Course, you know, I, I'm not, um, it was definitely a choice, but then like, how do you go back? Like, how do you go back to making stuff after kind of, you know, I don't know if it was escape. I mean, this is what blush is about, which is like, was I, I question myself, like, why am I doing this? Am I mm -hmm. avoiding my, th these things or is this an escape or is this, um, am I really needed? Right. And then there's right. like the need to be needed. Like that character in Blush needs to be needed. And I caught yeah, my- the, the log line of Blush is the sexual, psychological and moral unraveling of an obsessive compulsive suburban mom. <laughs> <laughs> Is yeah. that, is that, is that you? Is that part of you? Um, no, I'm not obsessive compulsive. Um, it's also about addiction blush. Um, but no, it's, 
it, I mean, no, the character is not me, but there's definitely me in every character in that movie. Sure. I mean, your, 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 your voice is very potent in all of your films. Um, which film do you feel like is the most representational or a character in one of your films is most representational of you? Um, I would say the limbo room, maybe. Mm. Um, that, Cause that was really drawn from real life. Um, right, right. And I was also, you know, having dealt with, you know, trauma to that degree, I, you know, what, you know, it's dealing with rape. So, I mean, that to me is like the most, I mean, I don't think I was really ready to talk about it. So I kind of was doing it through these other ways, which I'm kind of doing in all of these films. But, um, you know, it's also, uh, blush is a paranoid fantasy, really. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's very much a paranoid fantasy. It's a bit of a horror movie. I mean, all my films have like a horror element too. Sure. Um, and before the sun explodes, also like the male, the stay-at-home dad in the film <laughs> is very much, you know, they're all like. A part of you, You're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. right, 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 right. Male or female. <clears throat> so um, you've worked with a lot of the same actors over and over and over again. Um, is that something that, uh, what do you like about that process? Oh, well, there's a shorthand, obviously, like working with you, for instance, which, yeah. you know, when I saw you audition for the first time, I was just blown away. And I, and I knew, you know, immediately I wanted to work with you. Yeah. And I just get a vibe from people, you know, like some people I feel like, you know, I work when you're working in, in this way where you're working on such small budgets, you know, like really small budgets, you want to be surrounding yourself with people who are excited about what you're doing as you are. Right. Otherwise you're not going to get it made. So I don't really feel like, I feel like as long as people are excited and have that energy of like, we can do this, you have to do this, you know, and, I need you as much as you need me to make the thing. Right. And if I get that, there's like just a, a symbiosis or some kind of energy coming from that actor. And then when you, like you and Christine, and I, I just feel like you, we completely speak the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an unspoken language, but it's in a language that we don't really need to say much, you know? There's not much. I'm also, I'm also really appreciative of... Um, working with a a directors who've also been actors. And there's a, sh th there's a shorthand there too, um, in terms of, you know, when, especially working in an independent film where you have one or two takes and, you know, it's like, we got that one, it's fine, let's try something else. And if the note's not tangible, if it's not playable, then you're gonna get something kind of messy. If it's specific, then and I feel like actor directors who have been actors have, are, are always my favorite to work with because the notes are always very specific. Um, so digging into blush, like you've, you've talked about um, where you, how this film came to be in terms of writing about your fear. Um, what, what element of, of the, of, of fear were you attaching yourself on, onto when you, when you wrote this film? Um, well, at the time I started writing it, the seed started when I heard somebody say, I think it was David Lindsay O'Bear, who's a playwright, was talking about his teacher at Juilliard. It's like on NPR. Mm -hmm. um, I think Marcia Norman, a playwright. And he said she told him for Rabbit Hole to write from his fear. And I was like, that's a great you know, it's just a great idea yeah. just to, for a start. And at the time I was in this parenting group, I had, I think I was pregnant with my third. I had, a, you know, two toddlers. My husband was gone all the time. My mother was dying. I was dealing with all these things in my life that were so scary and so enormous. And I was in this group of people, with this group of people in this sort of parenting group that morphed into a group there, an unofficial group therapy 
where everyone laid out all their fears and all the things that were happening to them in their lives that were equally, if not more hard, like even more horrifying than what was happening in my life. And um, it was their stories and my own fear of what could happen, you know, that um, started me off. And that idea, like right from your fear. Um, it's really a spectacular, uh, there's so many elements of fear in this movie that, that, that the character goes through. Wendy, um, you know, is going through extramarital affairs. She's, she's afraid of her, uh, of her of relationship with her daughter. She's, she's, there's all these fears all across this sort of a spectrum of fear. And, and it's, it's really a fantastic. And then, it, then it all kind of implodes because yeah. it's like fear begets, you know, it's like, be careful what you fear in a way. Right. You wish for. <laughs> and it's funny. I mean, there's elements of this that are so, in all of your films, they're so tragically funny. So you're watching this character sort of unravel and try to put it back together. And it's, um, and it has your sort of unique take on, on comedy in the middle of all of that. Yeah, well, um, it's, yeah, it's supposed to be a comedy. Because it is. It is. I mean, it, it, there is a comedy to, to the darkest things. Totally. So yes, I think that um, it's a horror comedy. So, so to, to wrap this up, what's, what's the greatest piece of advice that you have received up until this point? Um, don't wait. Mm. Pick a day, don't wait. Pick a, wait. Pick a day, don't wait. Yeah. Great, cool. Well, Deborah, Thank you so much for doing this. Um, and about, I'd also like to thank everyone at the SAG Foundation. Um, and my wife and I have benefited from the SAG Foundation and the COVID-19. So thank you, thank you all so, so very, very much um, for the monetary donations um, that you're giving all these actors. And also I'd, like to I'd, also, I'd also like to thank Sharon Lawrence for, uh, for connecting Deborah and I to uh, the SAG Foundation so we could do this thank interview. You. Thank you, Sharon Lawrence. Thank you, Sharon Lawrence. And everybody go see Blush. Our movie comes... Oh, please, yes, pre-order on yes. iTunes right now, if you want. And it's, oh, it's uh, April 10th. It's supposed to be in theaters, but COVID-19, is the pandemic is preventing that from happening. So um, you can get it on demand in the in theater section for the next two months. Two months, so pre-order the movie. It's really so great. Pre-order the movie on iTunes, please. Yeah, okay. and, it, and it will be available on April 10th. So, um, watch it April Deborah, 10th. Yeah. thank you so much for doing this. It's so good to see you. I can't wait to give you a hug in person. Thank you, SAG, Screen Actors Guild. Thank you. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you.